Hello, right before lunch, thank you for being here. We're going to get cracking because we have 40 minutes for uh, the five uh, expert panelists that we have. We're going to talk today about meeting customers and users where they are. I am going to moderate the session. My name is Letty Conrad. I'm a product R&D consultant. Um, and this uh, group of experts is going to, uh, they're going to share a bit about what it means for their organization to meet customers and meet users where they are, how they do that, how they build that into their strategy, and then what outcomes they're seeing. And we are uh, on a tight schedule, so each of them has about five minutes uh, to share some prepared thoughts, and then uh, we will have time for questions. Um, and I will be keeping time to make sure that you get your questions in. Um, we are joined today by Scott Alberg, uh, COO of Reprints Desk. Scott has decades of experience in content, document delivery, and startup businesses. He has served in various roles with Reprints Desk since 2006, providing his expertise in operational innovation, copyright and content licensing, and quality management. Next to him is Erica Valenti, Executive Vice President for Admiral Group Publishing, leading sales and other initiatives in North America. And in my experience working at Emerald, I found Erica to be a very humble but very important voice in Emerald's leadership. Um, <laughs> it's recorded, so you're good. <laughs> so Erica, uh, with sales and marketing experience with MIT Press and others prior to Emerald, um, Erica is going to talk today about Emerald's real-world impact initiative. Next to her is Stacey Burke, Senior uh, Manager in Marketing and Communications for Publishing and Membership at the American Society for Microbiology. Stacey leads the marketing programs for the Society's Journals and Books portfolio, institutional subscriptions, and society membership. So she's got her hands full. Um, she works extensively in the creation, management, and implementation of strategic and tactical marketing campaigns to get the right content to the right audience. So really an ideal person to speak to us today about this topic. Next to her is Lisa Hinchliff, Professor and Coordinator for Information Literacy Services and Instruction at the University Library for the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Lisa, as many of you know, is a leading voice in our industry, and specifically for this panel, an experienced librarian with expertise in information literacy, assessment and metrics, scholarly publishing and communication, and library faculty collaboration. And we're going to get started today with Bert Corelli. Bert is Director of Partnerships for Trend MD. Bert is focused on achieving publisher goals for increasing, audi increasing the audience for journals and other content. Bert is a leader in driving change and honing strategies for targeting key user communities and increasing user engagement through better understanding of user behavior. So welcome me, Bert, and kick us off. Thanks, Liddy. And yes, Liddy Conrad, ladies and gentlemen, uh, done a wonderful job putting this, uh, putting this, this group together. TrendMD is focused on a uh, familiar problem in scholarly publishing. Too much content. With over two and a half million scholarly articles that are published each year, more than 8,000 each day, uh, to have a specific paper discovered and read and ultimately cited is enormously unlikely. The problem poses challenges both to readers as well as publishers. So, so how do publishers to start up publishers, how do they meet readers where they are? Many of you are probably familiar with the report, How Readers Discover Scholarly Content in, in, uh, in, in Publication, which has been produced every three years since 2005 by Simon Inger and Tracy Gardner. Here you can see some important changes over time in the ways that readers make use of discovery resources in order to stay up to date with the latest research in their area and within their favorite journals. A key takeaway is the growing use of search results pages, not just as an endpoint for retrieval, but as a starting point 
for browsing. And when you add to that the increasing use of social and professional networking sites and scholarly society web pages, it's clear that readers are looking to do more than just retrieve a specific document for open to suggestions and serendipity. When you focus on a publisher website, it's not surprising that the survey found that the users increasingly value the related articles functionality on the site. While the popularity of other website features like publisher produced news, site search, safe search, alerting continue to decline in popularity and usefulness. You could drill into each of those to draw specific reasons, but two overall conclusions jump out of the data. One is that readers want to know that they have visibility into the most comprehensive collection of content possible. And second, readers value the content itself more highly than summaries or news articles about the content. So hence the role of TrendMD. TrendMD recommends editorial and sponsored content across many of the world's most highly trafficked scholarly sites. We provide article recommendations that are tailored to the reader's interests, presented within the context of the reader's natural workflow. So how do we do that? Like Amazon or Netflix, TrendMD uses collaborative filtering technology, which recognizes that through your, through your browsing history and the history of other users who have read a particular article, what additional content you're most likely to be interested in. For example, if you buy a teapot on Amazon, they're not going to recommend six other teapots. You'll see other products that people who bought teapots subsequently bought, products that may or may not even be directly related to tea, but which have the highest likelihood of being clicked on by that cohort group or that, that group of readers. Likewise, a reader of a BMJ article about smoking will not be presented with more articles on the same subject exactly, but instead might see articles on lung cancer, tumor growth, or the health hazards of secondary smoke. And that can vary from uh, whether the, the user is a, a clinician or a researcher, um, or whether they're directly in the medical field or not. Recommendations, uh, we actually have data that, that shows uh, that this works. Um, this was a, a study that was done comparing how collaborative filtering uh, compares to a direct semantic matching algorithm like PubMed's automated uh, related articles function. Um, this was a study that was done over a six week period of time. And you can see that uh, the users are presented half of the time with uh, recommendations uh, generated automatically through semantic matching and half the time from collaborative filtering. And uh, what you can see is in the initial publishing of an article, both methods are very similar. Um, and, but over time, uh, it indicated in the blue, collaborative filtering, as it's learning more about the users who are, who are clicking on articles, uh, the improvement is shown in the click-through rate, which continues to increase. So the recommendations are both the publisher's own content and content from other sites in the network. The internal recommendations, increase engagement with the publisher's own users. The recommendations can be for the same journal or for publishers with multiple titles, a way to cross-promote between journals. The external recommendations are what we call sponsored content, enabling publishers to expose their content to readers of third-party journals. In this way, publishers are finding new readers from across the network. A unique credit system enables publishers to use TrendMD for free, earning credits by recommending external content. Um, publishers typically see an increase in overall page views from 3 to 5 percent, even using TrendMD for free. And higher increases come from purchasing additional credits through professional and enterprise plans. The additional features allow publishers also to shape the traffic they get, directing traffic to specific content they want to promote or targeting specific groups of users by country, by institution, or by profession. We display over 500 million article recommendations to over 105 million unique users each month. We help readers find interesting and useful content, and we help publishers monetize their content and drive higher engagement.
So good morning, or late morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Janicki Hinchliff. I'm the coordinator for Information Literacy Services and Instruction at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Like a whole one minute of my time takes that all up. Um, I'm particularly here to talk today about some work that I did as a co-chair member, back to being a member again, of our discovery and delivery services team in the university library. And I want to be clear as I kick this off, and I'm going to be talking about a lot of things, is that there's a very large team of people doing work on discovery layer and discovery for our users at our institution. So I particularly want to uh, give credit to Bill Michaud and Michael Norman, who are currently chairing this work at our institution. Um, in, um, we have a long history of, at Illinois of working on the question of how people are going to discover content. And I remember in my very first year at Illinois, I was asked in 2002 to chair our Access Services Working Group number one which was the question, <laughs> we had five working groups on access that year. So we had one looking at it, sort of more print materials, one looking at special collections, and the one that I was chairing was looking at this question of digital content and how people were finding, especially our subscribed content. And we made a radical recommendation out of that working group in 2003 that we should implement an open URL link resolver. It's kind of amazing to think that that was a, only a recommendation in 2003. I mean, it's 15 years ago where we were first bringing in, and in our case, it was SFX. But we also said that we needed to move along in the discovery of content um, outside of some of our publisher silos of our databases. And we worked at that point with trying to implement web feed. Some of you have been in the industry long enough to know web feed. Others of you have no idea what I'm talking about, and that tells you something about web feed. Um, and the fact that we never did fully implement it. And so out of our frustration in trying to implement web feed, we developed a tool that we have in Illinois, which we call Easy Search. <coughs> which is a federated, is a broadcast overlay system on a number of different database targets. Um, so we do not use a commercial discovery layer, although we do have EES, and it is a target of our local federated layer. Um, so it's a different kind of system than you're seeing in a lot of libraries. We have, over the years, also trialed the Primo for three years. So we are continuously looking at the marketplace of discovery layers and asking, what does Illinois need? So this is one of the, the key things that I bring to this uh, panel here, which is that we are, I would say, aggressively and assertively user-centric in our thinking at Illinois about the way that we discover our, de de develop our discovery layer. So we, of course, pay attention to what's happening in the marketplace. We have, Bill Mitchell has an amazing spreadsheet of all the people around libraries around the world who, you know, we track the trend to move away to bento box displays, et cetera. But ultimately, we are very user-centric. And so the, a project that I did a couple years ago was to study all of our user surveys. At that point, there was 11 years worth of user surveys where we asked people how did they want to find information in the library. So we also look at our transaction logs on Easy Search and our other tools. So we look at their actual behaviors of what they do on the site. Um, we do targeted surveys, focus groups, and interviews. We do a number of usability studies on the interface. And we look at the reports of other implementations, both our own as well as elsewhere. Our focus is understanding what the users in our particular community actually do and the choices they make as they do their work. We've also developed a taxonomy of user tasks that has to be supported by our discovery layer. By the way, all of this is written out in much more detail in the Scholarly Kitchen post that I wrote earlier this year, Discovery Should Be Delivery, in which I also presented the eight outcomes, or the eight principles that we derived from our user studies of preferences and behaviors about the principles that we will use that underscore our discovery layer for us. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of them. Number one here is that when library users say they want everything, they actually mean my everything. So the chemists are not pining away for results from the music databases. 
right? So this is a very important principle for us, which is why we are not in something like a Primo or an EDS as our sole discovery interface. And in fact, Easy Search is a platform that allows us to develop not only a general discovery layer, but we have developed subject-specific discovery layers for those areas and populations that um, particularly have unique needs that are not well served. So we have an engineering discovery layer, engineering easy search. We do have a music easy search across all of our disciplines. We have a number of portals. And so this easy search platform that we have developed lets us put different targets in for different user communities. Um, I will say that another one that's very important to us is that we not mislead our users. So at no point do we ever tell them they are searching everything that we have, because they aren't. So we very intentionally did not call this one search or total search or complete search. It's just an easy search. It's an easy starting point, it is not an ending point. We put people into the publisher interfaces, the platforms, as quickly as we can. Um, we decrease the steps from discovery to delivery. Um, Bill Michaud has done amazing work that if it is a known item search, we do a lot to post-process um, the searches that people put in in order to tell that. Um, we have one-click access to the publisher PDF from the platform if it is one of the top results of our targets. So our goal is that no user has to look at the metadata record. Now they can if they want, but we do give them one-click access to the PDF anytime that we can. And the final thing I'll just point out is the always offer a next step. This has to do with the sense that we've really gotten from our users is that they want to know that the tool is working in the way that they expect it to work. And that when it, they get no results or they don't succeed, they want to know what to do next. Okay? So we really took some of our hints here from Google and the way it makes you feel confident in your searching. So that's a particular library perspective. I'm turning it over um, to our next speaker. I'm just going to tell you guys, I'm leaving the stage because I'm freezing up here. I'll be right back as soon as we get to your questions. <laughs> just wanted them to know I wasn't like leaving in process. <laughs> Taking it very personally. <laughs> I'll make a note of that Lisa. <laughs> uh, Stacey Burke, I am um, the marketing manager at ASM, American Society for Microbiology. Um, I do publications and now membership, um, which seems like it doesn't make a lot of sense, but there's really a lot of overlap that I talk about. And again, I'm coming from the marketing standpoint, which is the flair of it all. <laughs> uh, I said to Lisa last night, I said, you know, I really like yours, you have data, I just have actions. <laughs> uh, but so I'm going a little old school, but you know, I think I'd be remiss to you know mention what Bert had mentioned, which is you know our information overload, um, which everybody is you know encountering library and publisher and, and what we're talking about today are users. Um, and we did a study and we found that in 1944 21 microbiology journals existed and then in 2015 over 5,000 to 5,800 journal article, journals have microbiology content. So, you know, the competitive factor about, you know, what we're competing with, but also that users are really trying to get through all this information to get the right content. So from a marketing standpoint, you know, we have to have some kind of strategy. Um, you know, I, I use this microphone a lot because I say everybody does all the work and I just get to yell about it, um, which really works for me. Um, so I mapped out a plan to have 50 messages to our over um, 13 or 14 research journals. Um, but what I really worked with was uh, you know, talking about what users want, and I don't know what users want, right? I can look at all the data, but our editors are really on the ground running, so I really get them to help choose our content. And I talked about it a little bit later, but you know, we have our manual, um, our automatic e-talks that are going out, but as Bert mentioned from Simon Inger's study, that people are just not looking at those, and I think they do the same thing I do. We just put it into, our, uh, into a folder, and then if you want to look at them, we go back and look at them later. So my point is to kind of you know, push them towards, you know, we say well, we're meeting users where we are, we're pushing them a little bit more with some uh, e-talks I talk about later. Um, and to, you know, I really liked how Lisa put it about, you know, having that content specifically to what they're looking for, um, you know, and, you know, 
same phrase from every marketer, right message to the right audience, but really it's about overload, right? So I'm reaching out to my authors that are just pertaining to that discipline within microbiology. I'm not blasting all of them about all of our journals at once. So that 50 sounds like a big number, but it's really segregated out. Um, and then the other element I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing is incorporating author and reader initiatives in my outreaches, not just the content. I know that they want content and we want them to have that, but I mean, part of my role is to make sure submissions are coming in and making sure that they know that we're making advances for them as readers and as authors. Um, and then this kind of goes into my last point, which is our librarians as partners. And I know a lot of people say that, but at one point I woke up and said, okay, I'm doing author outreaches and I'm doing librarian outreaches and I'm sending them different messages when really librarians are doing what I'm doing and reaching out to their authors and users. So why am I doing double work? So I've kind of been incorporating those messages a lot more and really kind of just working together with librarians and saying, I'm, I'm gonna give them the content that they're reaching out to, um, their users, and it, it helps me as well. Uh, so to go to what we're asked to do, like kind of tactics and outcomes, I talked about the e-talks earlier. We just souped them up a little bit more, um, and we do about four outreaches for each of our journals, and they're editorial chosen rather than um, what's coming out this, this month, right, this week. So um, they're smaller, they're shorter, but it's another focus to our users to say, come back to our, 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 our audience. And also, PS, please submit to us. This content is relevant to, you, to your research as well. So just to give us some outcome, in 2016, we had really hit a mark of, um, the, from the prior year, negative 12% on our submissions. So we knew we were in trouble. Um, I came in in 2017 and really did um, their first marketing plan. So I, you know, I, I look like I saved the day, but really didn't have any marketing before. So any marketing was good. <laughs> uh, and so we, you know, we loosened that, we tightened that gap a little bit more. And now we're about to say we're up 4% across all of our journals. Um, in our submissions, which gives us better content and um, uh, increases our users. The other interesting thing we did was um, we marketed a special journal that we had um, sponsored, actually, uh, to a new audience. Uh, we did an early career systems microbiology. This is one of our open access journals, and we actually had early career microbiologists submit research articles, and we were only publishing those early careers. And so, just like any TV program, you want to see yourself out there, and this is, you know, an early career person was able to go here and say, okay, I want to see what other people are doing at, at my level. Um, and we just, a simple marketing messages to, to support this, and this graph shows, um, in general, the year-to-year -year increase in users, as well as every time we did an outreach to promote the content within the special issue. Um, and the highlighting yellow are just the more users we had. So again, that old school marketing still, still works, people, I promise. Um, and then the other thing is back to the librarian tactics. You know, we did an account development newsletter, um, which had all the data that I talked about before. I'm really going to talk to you about author initiatives. We had a library advisory board last year, and we invited people just locally in the DC area where we're located. And I put on the agenda of author initiatives and publishing initiatives, hoping that this is what librarians were looking to 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 hear more about. And one librarian said the only reason she could come is because that was on the agenda. So I felt validated. Um, and it, it got people to come to, to the meeting, you know, and I know that we talk about this scholarly communications role, and I keep, I had to write it down because I keep trying to remember that, and I know that librarians are really growing in that function to help authors get published, and, you know, we talk a lot about, about this. So, I mean, you know, we're basically increasing our users and we're increasing our, our institutional subscribers. almost afternoon. Um, as Lenny mentioned, my name is Erica Valenti, and I'm going to share with you some of the work that we're doing on uh, research on a uh, real-world impact agenda. Uh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, we're off to a rocky start. Oh, thank you. Perfect. 
Got it. Thank you. Uh, so at Emerald, uh, we believe that our authors and users are at the intersection of theory and practice with a genuine need to demonstrate or apply research in ways that make a meaningful difference. And this really goes beyond citation and other established scholarly metrics. In fact, we went so far this year as to issue a um, real impact manifesto. And this was born out of our legacy of publishing applied content in business management fields and our mission for connecting research uh, to society. Our position really boils down to three basic tenets. One, supporting our communities to overcome barriers to impact. Two, challenging outdated approaches and incentives. And finally, driving impact literacy with new tools and resources. Now, this work that we're doing is being driven by both external forces, such as the UK's Research Excellence Framework, or REF, but it's also because our own authors, who are arguably our most important customers, if you will, um, tell us that they agree with meaningful real-world impact. So while we're aware that traditional measures can seem like a barrier to real impact, our authors from all over the world repeatedly tell us that research for its own sake is not working for them, the academy at large, or a wider audience, meaning society. In one survey, 97% of them said they believe their research has relevant outside of academia, but only 36 of those respondents said they felt incentivized to actually engage with non-academics. Uh, this year, we polled our key stakeholders again and asked them to select statements associated with demonstrating real impact of research. And the majority of survey respondents globally chose effects that are beyond and outside of the library tower. And far fewer selected popular metrics of influence and attention, with a notable exception being the journal citation and impact factors, which we know are important, but they most certainly aren't uh, all of the sort. So as such, our publishing um, offering is evolving to focus on the hottest topics within applied social sciences. We seek to attract impactful authors and research outputs in topics where interdisciplinary research is being funded to find answers to some of the grand challenges that are facing all of us. This would include uh, food and water security, sustainable infrastructure, and responsible management. Uh, we're adding value to the research that we publish by commissioning summaries and commentaries which look um, at the practical implica implications of research, and we're recruiting more practitioners and policymakers to our editorial boards. Emerald is also investing in technologies which make the answers within the papers we publish easier to find and digest, with all sorts of refined, uh, deeper semantic data tagging. And we're also looking at publishing more immediate, impactful out outputs such as the underlying research data that other audiences can make use of more quickly than the published research. Now, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. And like the social sciences, the SDGs tackle root causes of issues like poverty, um, and they're looking to make positive changes for both people and for our planet. So even Emerald's Corporate Social Responsibility Program supports the SDGs, with particular emphasis on gender and diversity equality, where we feel we can make uh, the biggest impact, particularly here in North America. And additionally, Emerald is partnering with academics, such as Dr. Julie Bailey, who you see on the screen. She is the Director of Research and Impact Development at the University of Lincoln. And we are looking to uh, develop standards, tools, and communication vehicles on teaching, creating, and measuring impact beyond the journal impact factor. And we recognize that impact is not straightforward, so we're developing a suite of support resources. And we really see our role is to help researchers tell their story in a meaningful way, what their research is doing, and to give them the right tools to bring their research to life. So we've launched a range of tools. We have an impact literacy workbook, which is for the research community. We also have an institu institutional health check, which is really for schools uh, and for librarians. We launched this year also an awards program where we're honoring the, the change makers and the champions of the impact debate, and also a blog to amplify their stories. Hi everyone, I'm 
Scott Albert, and I think it's very interesting that the five of us approach this question about meeting users where they are from very different perspectives. Uh, for my case, at Reprint's desk, uh, we take the assumption that the user has identified a piece of content and they're simply looking to access it. That's what, uh, that, that's what Reprint's desk does, and that access might come via uh, uh, entitled content, the subscription, or it might come through non-subscribed content. Uh, that's what we consider our challenge to be uh, when we look at meeting users where they are. So I recently attended the, the Frankfurt Book Fair, and a, uh, uh, if, if you've had a conversation with me in the last couple of years or seen one of my presentations, you might know that I've been particularly focused on the impact of Sci-Hub uh, and ResearchGate and other sort of uh, non-library means of accessing content, uh, illegitimate means of accessing content, if you want to look at it that way. And so this is a common topic of conversation when, uh, when I meet with publishers. So at the, uh, at the Frankfurt Book Fair last month, I just asked publishers for an update on where they're at uh, in considering the, um, considering the impact of, of Sci-Hub and ResearchGate on their uh, on their business and how they look at uh, how they're doing in, in um, delivering content to, to users. So I came back with these uh, these two quotes. Uh, I think you could essentially uh, one of these came from Taylor and Francis, and the other one came from Wiley. Though I told them I wouldn't uh, quote them directly, um, but I think the uh, you could uh, I think summarize the way publishers are looking at. Uh, not illegitimate or non-library access to content these days as uh, a certain amount of resignation that there's uh, that it's that it's always going to be there. It's not going to be possible to get rid of it, but that the appropriate response that uh, that publishers have, and I think we can also say that vendors and librarians have, is to try to do the best job possible at helping users access content through legitimate means, through through the library as it may be. So uh, that's how we take a look at Reprint's desk. At, uh, what can we do to help libraries provide um, uh, provide access to content? And we're currently working with a, uh, a university library surveying their interlibrary loan users, uh, considering that traditionally, if uh, if a user uh, is working with a library that doesn't have access to con uh, doesn't have access to a subscription, traditionally the alternative would be interlibrary loan. Uh, so we worked with this library to set up a, a survey of 200 recent ILL users and uh, got some interesting results. Now these are preliminary results, the, sur the survey is still going on and if you're interested in getting the final results, do, do come talk to me afterwards and uh, I'll make sure we get them to you. Uh, so I, I think the first result is pretty encouraging. 66% prefer to acquire articles through their university library. Of course I always like to take a uh, maybe a critical look at statistics and realize you could flip that one around. If you look at the fact that 34% prefer non-library alternatives, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, there wasn't any one thing that could be considered a non-library alternative. Sure, you could get an article from a colleague, perhaps. Uh, but today, there are real non-library alternatives out there, and that's why uh, at Reprint says we take a look at this as being an, ex an, an existential threat. Um, to libraries and to publishers uh, alike. Um, and of course, this is a survey of ILL users. So uh, consider that there's some bias in the sample that if they didn't use interlibrary loan, uh, they weren't even included in the survey. So that's likely to be a, a skewed statistic. Uh, so in the survey, we also asked users what they're frustrated with when they can't access content or in the challenges that they experience in, in accessing content. Um, we got very even results here. 46% are frustrated by journal paywalls, and 46% are frustrated by unavailable articles. Um, now, I think another piece of encouraging news is that 51% said that the most positive aspect of interlibrary loan is that it's free. Uh, but here we, we, we offered a, a spot to add some free text comments at the end. And we found that by far the most common uh, complaint from comments was that the scanned articles that they received during their library loan were uh, they were frustrated with the quality, basically. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't work with the text in, in many cases. That was a, a common content. Uh, and something that I think uh, 
that, that my colleagues here would, would echo is that 61% are, are unwilling to accept alternatives to the article they want. In which users often, by the time they've identified a piece of content they want, that's what they want. And, and they're not gonna they're not gonna accept um, something else. So this is, uh, this is an example of the problem we try to solve at Reprint's Desk when we work with our academic library customers. Now, we also work with uh, corporate libraries. And in the corporate library world, uh, it's a very different dynamic. Um, uh, cost is a bit less of an issue in the corporate library world. Uh, usually, uh, access to content is often thought of as mission critical, and the, uh, and the, cor and, and the corporation is likely to be willing to pay whatever it costs to get that uh, content within reason. Uh, so here, these are not survey results in this case. This is a um, view of uh, actual statistics from our document delivery service to corporate libraries. So in many cases with corporate libraries, we provide a link resolver, we provide uh, um, uh, filtering access uh, to, to different types of content. Uh, so it's a, it's a suite of services that's a bit different than what we offer to, to academic libraries. But it does enable us to get a pretty full view of the challenges that researchers within the corporate environment um, face and what, they, what their preferences are when they're trying to access content. Uh, so again, these are actual real world statistics. This is from, uh, from October of this year. 38% uh, of our users in that month followed a link resolver to a, either to a journal website, in many cases this would be our link resolver or one that we cooperate with, um, or to an open URL request form if it's uh, to non-subscribe content. Uh, an almost equal amount will key a citation into a web form, that may mean that they found the citation at the end of the, you know, the list of references at the end of an article. 14% uh, sent an email to an assistant. Um, now this is something I think this underlies the fact uh, underlines the point that I made earlier that in the corporate world there's uh, th th there's a goal to not provide any dead ends that you know so that uh, uh, corporations are typically willing to <coughs> do what it takes to, to make sure that the users access the content uh, they need um, and then finally we uh, we offer an API to uh, uh, to third parties as well as to corporate users. Uh, to corporate customers so that they can keep the user within whatever library environment, whatever discovery environment uh, they have access to. And uh, so 13% of our document delivery requests come in that way. So that, I think, is the last slide. So I'll turn it over to Letty. I should have mentioned that holding applause until now is great, so thank you. <laughs> We're right up against our time, but I want to uh, look to the audience. Are there questions? I certainly have a couple, but I uh, want to prioritize any questions you may have for the panel. Yeah, please. I'd like to ask the uh, um, speakers from Animal if they could clarify with the emphasis on um, reproducibility in research and um, evidence based and providing the data for potential repurposing and to use as a um, point of departure for future scholars as they um, plan their data. I mean, as they plan their research trajectories. Can you talk a little bit about the informality that you're introducing of um, opening it up, as I understand, to practitioners who may not endorse the rigors that we're now seeing enforced in publishing and in clarity for this effort in reproducibility, which it seems to draw tremendous amount of um, background and input in the peer review process. So can you kind of explain the um, practice versus the openness and within that rigor that um, publishers are seeing now is really required now. So the, the question is balancing reproducibility and rigor when you're dealing with practitioner audiences specifically. More, more open. Okay, more open approaches. Actually, yes. um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, given the fields that we publish in, we publish a number of journals that are specifically practitioner journals for that market. I would say that of those journals, there are about 20 of them 
almost all of them um, have an academic uh, editor. Um, there's an balance in those of uh, the articles that are authored by the you know, industry and by practitioners. Fifteen percent would be authored by academics. We like to think that they speak to each other and bridge that gap between uh, research and practice. I'm not sure if I'm totally answering your question. I think it's a big one. I wonder if other panelists have thoughts on sort of in this context, um, and especially with the demands for open, uh, thoughts on reproducibility and, and rigor in that context. So maybe as one of those practitioner, practitioner, uh, practitioner, <laughs> <laughs> you know, practitioner authors who also happens to be faculty, but um, you know, in this librarian role, I think part of the question that comes if I'm sort of getting this correctly too, is the degree to which practitioner research um, sort of, if you will, is partially judged by its reproducibility. Because a lot of practitioner research is in that sort of action research, problem solving mode. And unless you have the exact same problem, you're not gonna have the reproducibility question because you're not coming at it from that same hypothesis driven. Which I think is where a lot of the open data um, and reproducibility questions come in. Um, which is this idea that you're kind of more testing hypotheses as opposed to applied problem solving. So I think one of the questions for me then becomes, if a data set gets repositive that is in that applied mode, how is it understood by somebody else coming upon that that that's what that data set is? Is that it was developed in this sort of mode of, of applying to a problem as opposed to sort of a data set to to which it can be subject to multiple inquiries and reproducibility. So maybe it's a little bit of a question also about metadata and how that data is presented for reuse. I don't know, Julia could be like, I don't think so, I don't know. But that's something to come to mind for myself as somebody who works within that practitioner researcher realm of. Do you have a Well, and I think it gets to the, the variations in information behavior across the disciplines, right? There are the expectations for information retrieval and archiving and metadata and that kind of thing does vary across uh, different fields of study. Well, I would argue that for the policy industry, it does really differ that much across the country because um, new standards and expectations really trump um, the discipline. I think the action oriented research and things like that are essential, but I think that's but it's so grounded in the same um, structure. Other thoughts on this from other folks on the panel? No? Other questions from the audience? We're just a, a smidge over time, but happy to stick around if there are other burning questions. Okay, well, thank you for your time and thank our panelists for their expertise.